an applied social psychologist, which most people haven't really heard of. Um, basically being an applied social psychologist means that I take theories and ideas from like psychology research, from social psychology research, and I apply it to real world problems. And my specialty is in health psychology. So that means that I, I take like I take different social social psychology theories and I apply it to problems that impact our health and our well-being. So, um, for example, I use a lot of uh, of work related to the theory and and um, well, I'm just going to say theory uh, related to uh, the need for belonging, and I apply that to how our need for belonging and our need for connection impacts our health and our well-being. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's talk about our need for connection and our need for belonging, because what I've found, I've interviewed several Live Jasmine members, models, and experts like yourself, and one of the main things I found on the member side is that many of them, they maybe don't necessarily feel like they belong to a certain degree in the sense of they um, might have a disability and so their social life is hindered because of that because they have to stay home or they're single and they just went through a divorce and so they're feeling cut off but still wanting that connection. I'm curious your thoughts on that group of individuals and what benefits they could potentially be receiving from a, a platform like Live Jasmine? Oh yeah, people who are are forced to have more isolated lives. Either maybe they live in remote areas, or they have a disability that makes it hard for them to get out and interact in the world. They, I mean, we all saw what it was like being more isolated when we all had those stay at home orders because of the COVID nineteen pandemic. So, like, imagine that but like no end in sight because what are you going to do like you can't you can't take a vaccine to to end end your disability that's that's making you homebound so thing online interaction becomes a really important conduit a really important lifeline to feel that connection to other people and so something like jasmine where people can um kind of have that give and take, like that's the thing that makes camming so much different from regular pornography because you're not like with regular porn, you're just kind of like throwing it on the video and the performers are there and they're doing their thing and you're watching it. But with a cam person, a cam performer, you are interacting with them. And that that is have creating opportunities for that, creating that sense of connection. We know um, like from an evolutionary perspective, like that sense of that need for intimacy and that need for connection that's how we've survived as a species like human beings like we're pretty pathetic we're pretty weak on our own as individuals so living in groups and learning to be able to count on one another that's how we've been able to survive and thrive this long and kind of take over this planet so even when we're having we have like adverse conditions like that's especially when we need to feel that connection. So this sense of belonging or need for belonging is really ingrained in us and um, and wanting to feel that. And, and there's really like two kinds of things that we need, right? Like you need to feel um, connected to a group. So you need kind of that like that social um, feeling of like, I've, I've got like a network of friends. I've got a network of people that I can count on. But then we also ha kind of have this need to have feel that sense of intimacy with like, um, on like a deeper level with individuals. So we've got like these two needs for connection that we have. And we also know from um, like super fancy meta-analyses, which is like a fancy way of condensing a whole bunch of research data and being able to compare, or to condense it into numbers that we can compare so we can directly compare the importance of different health behaviors. We know that having strong social connections is as important for your health as quitting smoking like that's we have we have the data like we know like having that social connection is so important and i mean if you know anything about quitting smoking like it's very important that's the most important health behavior we tell people what they can do like if you want to change your health and your smokers quit smoking so now we know that more important than that or as important than that is make sure that you have sources of social connection in your life Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> very well said. And we are in the digital age. My question to you is for those people who are um, maybe missing that in-person connection or 
belonging to some type of social group and maybe they are finding it through Live Jasmine or even a Facebook group and they're just interacting in that way. Is that sustainable? Is that enough? Um, Does that help? Does it fill in the gap? What are your thoughts around that? The research on this is really mixed right now. And I think that's partly because a lot of this research was done before the COVID-19 pandemic. I feel like the pandemic really helped people realize like, oh, actually these online sources of social support are like pretty decent and pretty important. Like I know um, I ended up getting really into academic Twitter during that time. And I ended up being like, well, e-meeting, uh, like really interesting groups of people and getting turned on to like some really cool research areas and making really good connections that has turned into all kinds of interesting opportunities. But, you know, I, I also um, maintained friendships that were already online for me. Like I, I have really good friends that I don't get to see that often. Um, one of them lives in like North Carolina and one of them lives in Guelph, which is only an hour away from where I live, but I still don't get to see that often. But they are those these two friends, we have a group chat going and they're basically always in my pocket. Like if I'm having a rough day, I can just message them and be like, oh, hey, like this is what's happening with me. Like, can you believe it? Or like, do you have any advice or, you know, just like commiserating. And and uh, and that's been like an amazing source of social support for me. That's just kind of in my pocket all the time. And so these online sources of social support through social media, through something like Jasmine, that is that can have a lot of benefits but there's not research evidence to really demonstrate that yet. I'm actually working on a research study right now. I'm collecting data right now where I'm looking at these, this, exactly this, like is online social support, like is that is that enough? How does that compare to in-person social support? So I'm collecting a bunch of data. I'm tracking different groups of people over a six month period and we'll see, maybe next year I'll have some data to actually answer this question, but right now, I feel like I can just kind of go off of what I feel like, what feels true, but I don't have the research evidence to back it up. (laughs) You know, I really relate to what you said with that pocket support. I like that, (laughs) that pocket (laughs) support. It's almost like a constant support that you're right. It just goes with you wherever you are, because now that we have the phones, it's just a voice note away or a call away or a text away or whatever it is. And I myself have found that to be very comforting and soothing um oh, yeah. and supportive yeah i mean it, when, when you're a kid you can see your friends all the time like when you're in school like you're with your friends all day but when you're an adult like you're not with your friends all day like maybe if you're really lucky you're really friendly with the people you work with but i mean in my situation like i get along really well with the people i work with in my lab but i don't actually see them in person that often i see my lab members more often virtually we have zoom meetings um most of my for one of my big research projects the team is split in three and half the part of the team a third of the teams in montreal and a third of the teams in vancouver so we're almost never in the same space and um and yeah like having being able to like interact like i have some of the other postdocs in in my lab um we have like a, a whatsapp messaging chain and uh and i probably interact with one of the other postdocs in my lab way more through WhatsApp than I ever would in person. (laughs) Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's such a shame that there is the stigma around camming because I think that the performers are, they're so much safer with camming and they have so much more control and so much more power. Um, There's so much less pressure on them. Um, And so, yeah, it's, but the, the problem with kind of our culture is we're really weird about sex stuff. I mean, I find that even as a sexual health researcher, there's some conferences that I go to and like, I've had people show up to my presentations, like expecting my work to be kind of a joke because it's sexy. And I'm like, ah, uh, no, like this is, I'm like, this is serious health research. And then like, as they listen, that's actually one of my favorite conference moments is I had a bunch of people show up to a presentation thinking that I was a joke. And then as they listened to my me present, they, I could see like the smirks drop off their faces because they realized that my research actually has important health impacts. So that was pretty great. But that's also like, a demonstration of like how stigmatized it is even among like a research community who are supposed to be like a little more chill and a little more I don't know professional you would think people would be like oh here's another researcher presenting their stuff so like if we can't if people can't keep it together in a research sphere like of course like people people stigmatize and and have all kinds of hang-ups about sex like I mean that's why I've got friends who are sex therapists and they have to turn away clients because 
this our hangups about sex are just like so deep and they cause so much harm and to cause so much stress for people and so something like like what your your members maybe can experience is they're kind of actually in this uncomfortable nexus of like their stigma around sex stuff and then there's also stigma around feeling lonely and so it becomes this kind of thing where like oh like if you're right people don't want to admit that they're feeling lonely and then people also don't want to admit that they're interested in in sex which is ridiculous because everybody's interested in sex (laughs) there's not research evidence to support that your brain can get addicted to sex or pornography in the same way that you can become addicted to like cocaine um or or things that are like really addictive but what is what what does become a problem is um the reasons why people are using those things, the reason why people are, are, um, uh, kind of become like obsessed with different sexual activities or become, um, that's, that's really the underlying reason for that is, is kind of like where the, the like feeling of addiction comes from and people who don't feel as much shame about their sexual activity are way less likely to feel that they have some kind of like addiction to something. And so we know that like, a lot of a lot of our sexual problems, uh, definitely not all of them, but a, a portion of them are coming from people having this stigma, having these negative feelings, unjustified negative feelings about sex and things that are sexy and sexual behavior. Like, look at how uncomfortable it is for people who want to nurse a baby in public. It can be so uncomfortable because they're they're bearing their breasts in in public, and in our culture breasts are sexy and that's it yeah but like in other cultures there's like we're able to like see the differences like this in this context they're not sexy it's food and in this context it's sexy and it's great but when you can't stop seeing these things entangled and it becomes kind of this 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 toxic thing where like your hang-ups about sex kind of create all kinds of problems and not just problems for you, but it can create problems for other people as you throw judgment. Like that's where stigma comes from, right? It's like you, you internalize, you might internalize negative feelings that you have that other people have expressed or other people are being mean to you and you don't want to have people be mean to you about the thing that you're interested in. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And another component to this, which I, I found really interesting is that the members I've talked to have basically said um, maybe they had like a fantasy or something of that nature that they had been curious about, but they were afraid to explore with a partner or maybe ashamed or scared or whatever. And so when they're in a, you know, um, when they're on a platform like Live Jasmine, it's kind of safe to explore that um, with a model. And I've had many members say they found out like, Oh wait, no, I actually don't like that. Or I love that. And it kind of taught me more about myself, you know, like it was almost like just them having the safe environment to explore this thing actually helped them know more about themselves. And another interesting component is that many of these men have said that because the models responded so positively to them in whatever way, um, just in a conversation or acting something out, they felt more confident to share things with a partner like, hey, I'm I'm interested in this, or um, they felt more confident to approach a partner. And even one, a few of them have told me like, they felt more confident at work just from having that t- attention from a beautiful woman. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. I love that. Um, I, I love that story. I think that that is fantastic. Like having this opportunity to try out ideas in a situation where you feel like it's safe and getting that positive response. Um, I mean, it's, we know that something like social support, Um, getting that feeling of social support from from the models uh, it seems like it's having like a a very good benefit for these members if it's increasing their confidence even outside of these uh, of figuring out whether they want to enact different sexual fantasies um, getting positive responses from people is a real confidence boost and that's really fantastic it's a really unique and really valuable resource because if you didn't have something like that then like what's the next closest option it's maybe 
hiring an in-person sex worker, which depending on where you live is very challenging because think different aspects of like I live in Canada, different aspects of it are criminalized. Um, like being a sex worker is not criminalized, but hiring one is, or like, it's very confusing. And that makes doing that, getting that kind of service really strange and uncomfortable and, and uh, the legality of it. And then, I mean, and then you have like a whole real person in front of you, which is in some ways, maybe great, but in other ways, um, maybe not exactly what you wanted and um, maybe less convenient because you can't just log on whenever you want and see a person in person, you have to like make an appointment, book them. But like, if you know the, your model schedule, you know when they're available and you can just log in and they're right there. <laughs> Absolutely. And just, you know, from a physical aspect, there's so much more risk that comes with an actual in-person meetup and oh, yeah. for both sides. And um, so that's another component on why camming, like you said, it's really a unique resource because it's interesting because I know that uh, models are considered sex workers, but no one ever touches anyone. Yeah. yeah, They're not at risk of like being beaten up. They're not at risk of, of being murdered. Like it's, it's a very safe form of sex work. It's, um, it's pretty, it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. And you know, um, what I've also discovered by talking to a lot of models is that it has actually solved a bit of a gap for single moms because they're able to work from home and be safe and be in their own environment and not have to worry about child care, not have to worry about going into an office and leaving their, you know, whatever the case is. Okay. And they kind of are able to you know, obviously there's a lot of money that can be made in this industry. So they're able to really take control financially as well and provide, which as a single mom is, um, can sometimes be difficult, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Th that's, that's huge. I mean, we're doing this interview during my baby's nap time and, uh, I totally get it. <laughs> now I want to be fair in the interview and I'm curious, and you can tell me honestly, from your perspective, what are some of the issues uh, with camming that you see? Oh gosh. I mean, I think there's still the potential for some exploitation of the models, um, depending on the company they're working with. If they're working with a, a reputable company, they have good managers, then I, I think that they, the risks are awfully low. Um, but I think a lot of the other issues come from the, the stigma from society, which is really unfair. Um, it's, it's not something that, uh, that I, I think is, uh, a reasonable, um, downside or, or risk that that model should have to deal with, um, because it's, it's employment, it's work. And, um, and so it's kind of frustrating that like, this is something that they might, you, they might not want to put on their resume as like, oh, I have three years experience of camming, even though like that's a viable, that's a that's a real work option that you could have. But then, you know, if you're applying to to work in an office later, somebody might be like, oh, that's that's weird. And you know, I I know some of the models worry about people finding out, people in their family or communities finding out and and judging them for that. And that sucks. Uh that's not a that's I feel like so that's a risk, but I feel like that's an unjust risk. <laughs> when you are paying somebody to talk to you, you almost feel like you can be your more true self because you're like, oh, well, I paid for this time. I don't have to be fake. I don't have to try and like manage the other person's feelings. I'm just going to say what I want to say. And, and it's a shame that people don't feel free to do that in their regular relationships. Um, everyone should be able to have somebody they can be real with. But if this is a way that you can have, feel like you can be real and say your real thoughts with somebody like, that's great. That's a great gift. I mean, it's not, I mean, they're paying for it, but <laughs> it's a great thing to be able to purchase. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's kind of like therapy, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you pay yeah. for therapy, but that's one of the perks is that you kind of get to just really be authentic and true and, and talk to someone who's non-biased, who doesn't know anyone in your life. And I can't say that men are substituting therapy with camming, but 
What I do know is that there is also stigma around men going to therapy. And it yeah. seems like they feel more comfortable doing a very similar thing with the model who's pretty much just listening most of the time. Yeah. Um, they seem to be more comfortable in talking to someone that way. I think that any model who decided to go to grad school and become a clinical psychologist after this or become a get a therapy degree would do really well. <laughs> I agree. And there are plenty of them. I sometimes will ask models like, what's your 10 year plan? Well, I'm going to go and become a counselor. And I'm like, oh, you have great experience, don't you? That's, that should be something they should be able to put high up on their resume. Absolutely. When, because, you know, this is this is great experience for building that. And uh, we often have like students. Um, so I, I don't work with a lot of clinical psychology students, but I the ones that I have worked with, they, they all like volunteer for the distress center and take calls on there. But all that is, again, is just talking to people, just being a listening ear. And um, I think that can performers should be able to put that on their CV, feeling heard is super important. I think that's something that the models, they provide that. They they make these members feel heard and seen, even if they're not seeing them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very interesting because most of the models I've talked to, they've almost all of them have said that they at times feel like a counselor or a therapist. When I ask them to describe what it is that they feel like they do and they feel like they listen the most. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I like to end the interviews by asking one final question, which is just how do we create a more sex positive society? I think that's a great question. And that's an important question for people to be thinking about. I think that from my perspective, I think it starts with teaching sex ed using a sex positive approach in people's homes and schools, um, because I think that that's a way that we can stop some of the stigma before it starts. And I, cause I, I mean, I, I said earlier, like, I think that a, a lot of problems that people have come from this stigma around sexuality. And I think that when we take a sex positive approach and do comprehensive sex education, it takes away some of the stuff that's scary and mysterious and takes away some of the judgment um, that, that can really hurt people. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. No problem. Great chatting with you. Yeah, you too. <laughs>